one year ago. A fiery response to an unprecedented attack by Hamas on Israeli soil. Tonight, we're in Jerusalem, where there is an overwhelming feeling of shock, anger, fear, as Israel declares war. And 12 months later, it is not over. Today will be a day filled with complicated emotions for so many people, especially those with close ties to Israel and to Palestine. So on the show, we'll hear how this latest chapter of violence is affecting Jewish and Palestinian people right here in Saskatchewan. Be, I had hoped that it would be a bit of a memorial day than it was a we're still in it day. And the conflict is actually expanding now to other countries. So these been very heavy 12 months on myself and many people around me and people I talk to. Since October 7th of last year, I feel like as a Jewish person, there's a target on us. A lot of people that I've done organizing with for like decades are like, everybody I think feels kind of um, despondent. I'm aware that every Jewish event now comes with a lot more security. And so their stories today on Blue Sky. We recorded these conversations over the last couple of weeks, and we know that they represent only a small fraction of the perspectives that are out there. Our hope, though, is that today's show provides a window into the lives of five people in Saskatchewan deeply affected by the war. Lauren Sharfstein is a lawyer in Saskatoon. I've interviewed her a couple of times over the years about anti-Semitism and online hate speech. Lauren is Jewish. One year later, her emotions are still raw as she reflects on what happened. Israeli authorities say on October 7th, 1,200 people were killed and 250 were taken hostage. That is the biggest death toll of Jews since the Holocaust. Um, That doesn't sit well with many people, especially Jewish people. Um, It's a scary time. It is. I can even feel the emotion in my voice. Um, I walked in here thinking, I'm happy I'm talking about it a year later. It's not as fresh. Based off of <laughs> the emotion in my voice, I can tell that it's still impacting me on a daily basis. Um, it is, it's a scary time to be an Israeli. It's a scary time to be a supporter of Israel. It's a scary time to be a Jew. Um, in Saskatchewan, in Canada, Um, and there's always those underpinnings probably for Israelis and Jews at all times, but since October 7th, that has magnified exponentially to a point that I had hoped I wouldn't see in my lifetime. Um, The October 7th attacks as an isolated event were horrible. But to go back to the question on how it impacted me, it's continuing to impact me because of the ripple effect that we're seeing. Um, Anti-Semitism is on the rise. It has been on the rise for years. Um, But the blatant anti-Semitism we're seeing throughout Canada and the world really puts Jewish people on guard. Um, And that is something that we have to live with and grapple with each day of what we're going to do about it and how we're going to work through it. Um... And one of the key things is those 250 hostages that you mentioned. We still have hostages that we need to get home. How has that changed your day-to-day? Like, you, you did say that, that it's a scary time, mm-hmm. even for someone in Saskatchewan. Tell me more about that. Like, has that caused you to, to change how you are in this mm-hmm. city? Originally... It was after October 7th of last year. It was hard to function normally, Um, to get up and go to work and keep the day-to-day routine as if October 7th hadn't happened, that the war in Israel was coming to a head, that um, family and friends that we have in Israel are at risk, that um, hostages are taken and at risk to just get up and continue to function as if everything was normal um, was very, very difficult. Um, But it was probably one of the first times in my life that I felt that sort of borderline debilitating um, 
anguish and sadness and fear. Um, but for me, at least, I found I needed to put boundaries on it. Um, it wasn't something I realized within a few months was going to go away easily or quickly. Um, so finding boundaries on how engaged to be, um, when to be engaged, when to read things, when to get invested, um, because I feel it's just something I sort of have to live with. Um, I, it was it was a few months after October 7th. I want ugh, I should have remembered the exact date. But there was a call for basically the death of Jews across the world. Um, and it was a call to action, basically, to, to put it in blatant terms, to kill Jews wherever you were. And where did that call come from? That like, are you talking about some of the protests? It was it was prior to the protest. It was it was it was probably November or December, and it was. I don't want to misspeak on where yeah. that call came from, and I can I can come back and give that to you afterwards, but I don't want to yeah. hypothesize on it. Um, but you knew that that was that was there. Th- I knew that was there. That was sort of spread. It was probably a, amplified by social media. It probably was maybe within that realm a bit more. Um, but it was as we were seeing sort of an uptick of the support of the October 7 of the tax and um, the target of Israel and, and, and Jews to follow. Um, and it was a work day. I think it was a Wednesday or something. Um, the law firm I work at is a well-known Jewish firm. Um, our name sort of is a giveaway. <laughs> um, and I was worried. I didn't know sort of if we should feel vulnerable. And um, I I work with other Jewish people. They said they're coming to work. They're going to live their lives. Um, Had the discussion with my family. What's everybody planning on doing? And we decided that we're just going to live. And um, If something was to happen to us, because we're Jewish, we will die a proud Jew. And um, that decision as a family, as a group, um, is, has changed my mentality post-October 7th. I will live every day as a proud Jew. I will let my love of Israel be known. And if something happens because of that, that's okay. And that is when you ask the question, what, how has things changed for me? I was, I've always been a proud Jew. Um, but I've always known the limitations of wearing it on my sleeve. Every Jew knows there's anti-Semitism out there. Since October 7th, I am a very, very vocal and proud Jew. And if repercussions come from that, that's okay. Have you have you faced repercussions though? How how open can you be? You know, like mm-hmm. I've heard um, this came after the Toronto International Film Festival. There was a, a documentary that was shown or a film that was shown, and the reviewer said it was so obvious the crowd was pro-Israel but anti-Netanyahu. Mm-hmm. And so I, I I am wondering like how open you mm-hmm. can be about your stance. Mm-hmm. And if you're, if you're, if you get questions yeah. about how you, how you can stay so strong in, in your beliefs. Questions are great. We love questions. That's why I love being here. I love the opportunity for it. Questions are good. We want dialogue. We want questions. Um, what we don't want is people who are so um, grounded in a certain worldview or opinion that they're too afraid to ask questions or won't even go that route. Um, the Saskatchewan community is wonderful. Um, I, I have family members in Toronto. Um, it's a very different story for them. The fear that they feel on a daily basis is a bit different. Um, our Jewish community here feels very supported. Um, I don't worry um, on a daily basis out on the street. I think I would feel different if I'm in Toronto, so I'm probably sitting in a very privileged seat to be able to say I can be that proud Jew. Uh, maybe it'd be a lot different if I was really worried um, on a daily basis. And sort of the questions that have come my way, and, and it has been um, 
a respectful inquiry and really want people wanting to know more and to learn more and to ask questions kind of like, okay, so is it, do you just support Israel because you're Jewish? And what is that? And what's going on? What are your thoughts on Netanyahu, even if they get there? Or is it political? Or is it personal? Or is it cultural? Or is it religious? Those are wonderful questions. How have you personally processed the the death toll in Gaza? Because since October 7th, right, like the story has evolved. Now we're talking about Lebanon. Absolutely. It's complicated and it's the human toll is just hard to even put into words. And so I'm wondering how, how you're processing that part of it. Not well. <laughs> um, I had hoped that I wouldn't see this magnitude of, of war and of death tolls. Nobody wants to see that. If you sat beside somebody who said they were happy or were processing well that death toll in Gaza, you got to get that person checked out. <laughs> it has nothing to do with right or wrong or history or right to land or anything. Death is not the answer. War is not the answer um, on any side of the token. Um, I wish I could sit here and tell you what the answer 100% is and that it could... I could snap my fingers and make it happen. I think we can sort of hypothesize and think of things. But death is not the answer. Will you be taking some time on October 7th to to reflect? How do you think that day will be for you? Yeah, I hadn't thought of that. Um, I'd hoped by October 7th of this year we wouldn't have to really be... I, I, I'd hoped that it would be a bit of a memorial day than it was a we're still in it day. Um, I feel like Jews and Israelis are in fight or flight mode still a year later. Um, it is going to, st- we're, we still have so much currently happening that it's hard to sort of, I think, like memorialize it. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, we have to and have to spend some time that day thinking about it but it's still our reality a year later it, it, it is unfathomable to me that a year later this is where we're at I still feel like we're, we are exactly where we were a year ago maybe even worse today is likely to be an emotional day for many people in Saskatchewan especially those with cultural and religious connections to the Middle East Iman Al-Madawi is a Palestinian Canadian professor who lives and works in Regina I'm feeling so tired. Um, We've been dealing with this for 12 months. We know we didn't think that it's going to take that amount of time for people to suffer and people to be watching around the world. So it's been now 12 months where the genocide in Gaza has started. More than 42,000 people have been killed. Over 100,000 people are injured. All 2.2 million population have been displaced, um, not once, not twice, dozens of times. There are no schools, there are no hospitals, no safe zones. Schools are bombed when people are using them for um, shelters. Full families were wiped out. Um, No healthcare system. People are starving. They cannot find something to eat. And we're talking about 12 months so far. And it's been going, and the conflict is actually expanding now to other countries. So these have been very heavy 12 months on myself and many people around me and people I talk to. What's it like for you to wake up every day in Regina, you know, to be so far away from it, but yet to be living it yourself? What's what's that like for you? Um, it's It's like you need to have double personalities or double um, uh, feelings at the same time. You need to manage to have your day move. Um, The first thing I do every day when I wake up is to pick my phone and check the news. Did the war stop or not? Honestly, I wake up every day checking. I'm hoping that there is a stop and there is no stop. And there are some nights where I cannot uh, stop myself from watching the news or watching videos coming out of Gaza and watching the kids um, having their 
being killed or the parents are dying, the kids, they have nowhere to go. And I can't sleep that night. Um, it's been a very heavy 12 months on me. And then I start my day and then I need to go to work and you need to smile and as if nothing is happening. So that dual personality or feelings, mm. you have to show something while you're feeling something else. It's really hard. But this is the reality that I am living right now and trying to cope with. Yeah. In your work life and in your day-to-day -day life, do people know what you're going through? Like, do people know that you're Palestinian? What, what Do yeah. they know that? Yes, uh, many people around me, they know uh, that I am Palestinian. Some people sometimes check, but it is a heavy conversation. So people sometimes try to not keep asking questions. Um, but at the same time, yes, many people know, they ask me questions. Um, I went over the summer and visited family in Jordan uh, because my uh, I am originally Palestinian, but my grandparents were displaced in 1948 and in 1967 uh, uh, to Jordan. So they were refugees in Jordan. Um, and it's it's harder there. The feelings are everywhere in the street. People are not happy. People are waking up every day waiting for an end, but there is no end to this. The killing is getting more and more. People are suffering more and more. And the time is just moving and the world is watching. That is the main thing. The world is watching. A human being being killed somewhere is different than 42,000 living in genocide. The double standards we are experiencing are just devastating. We cannot, we cannot actually understand why Palestinians are treated differently than others. When a soul is killed, it is a soul. It's not who they are. These people are being killed just because they are in that zone. Everyone should imagine if their kids are sleeping to bombs, how they would feel if they can't sleep or not. So um, it, is, it is painful. It is painful. How have your relationships with other people in the community changed? Are you feeling supported? Are you feeling isolated? Um, in the most of it, I actually feel supported. So there are many groups that are supporting uh, Palestine. For example, there is Regina Solidarity uh, Group for Palestine. And this group includes people from different faiths and from different directions of life. Um, I've never been in a group where we have Muslims with Christians and Jewish and many other um, uh, interests coming together for the one cause. So it is actually uh, created more relationships uh, within uh, the community in general. What do you think October 7th, 2024, will look like for you I, i've heard from other folks who say you know it will be a day of remembering people who have died i've heard others say they feel so much anger and so i'm just curious how you picture october 7th specifically for you so when we look at october 7th we need to remember that it's that's not where the story started. The truth is it didn't even start in 1948. One could even argue that it began with the development of Zionism as an ideology. However, to only focus on October 7th, um, while turning a blind eye to the terror Israel has caused on multiple countries and the injustice that is happening is wrong. So I think um, it is a day for me to remember that the world is blind and is supporting a genocide. And I feel much more angry day after day, seeing this is continuing to evolve, seeing more countries are included now in the conflict. Um, 
and there is no um, attempt to stop it. It's just continuous and it is, um, it is expanding to the whole region. Where do you find strength these days, Iman? I find strength when I talk to people who are um, not within my uh, community and they're very supportive. I find strength in that. I find strength when I talk to, there are different organizations that are trying to help right now in terms of, for example, there is an organization trying to help students from Gaza to come uh, to other countries and they're supporting them with their application and visas. Um, I feel when I see this kind of support from the community, I feel strong. I feel strong when I go to a protest or a rally and I find people from different directions coming to that rally and see them supporting the Palestinian cause. I find strength when I talk to someone who had some misinformation and misunderstanding of the Palestinian situation and the Palestinian uh, history, and they try to um, read about it and they're asking questions about about the history and trying to find resources to educate themselves. That's where I find strength. You're listening to Blue Sky on CBC Radio 1. Today we are reflecting on the last 12 months as the war between Israel and Hamas has unfolded. We sat down with Saskatchewan people, five of them, some of them Jewish, some of them Palestinian, to get their thoughts on what the last year has been like. Jeffrey Hendren moved to Saskatoon just a year ago, and he says he's quickly become part of the city's local Jewish community. In fact, he just got married a few days ago at the synagogue, and he says it was one of the first joyful gatherings the community has had at the synagogue in a very long time. He says navigating Saskatoon as a Jewish person has been challenging. Saskatoon is a very friendly, welcoming place, unless you're a Jewish person. And that's a surprise to me. It's not something I expect because day-to-day interactions uh, for me so far have been fine. Um, Except since October 7th of last year, I feel like as a Jewish person, there's a target on us, uh, on myself. And I feel like when people that are non-Jewish meet me or find out that I'm Jewish, there's always that, you know, tightening of the chest and shoulders rising and I wonder where are they going to go with how they feel about me and it's it's always one of two ways uh, it's either one of oh my gosh how are you doing or isn't that terrible what your people are doing how do you respond to, to that I have a couple different responses that I basically keep trying to see which one seems to work best because I I do want to educate people. I do find that the majority of people are actually quite uninformed as to what's truly going on in the conflict uh, in Israel. And I think a lot of people are surprised to find out that they're actually anti-Semitic or that they hold anti-Semitic views and perhaps didn't realize it. So I try to take an educational approach and just say, you know, death is absolutely terrible. You're right. Uh, And then I sort of see where they want to go from there. Um, But if it's one of, like, it's, you know, the accusatory, can you believe, you know, what the Jews are doing over there in Israel? And it's like, well, I sort of take the, you mean, fearing for their lives, wondering when the next attack is coming, running for shelter every time rockets are fired from southern Lebanon or from Gaza, uh, basically sitting in a country of only a few million people while the rest of the world seems to judge us for being victims. There is one Jewish state in the world and every Jewish person has a connection to to Israel. Whether we're from there or not, whether we've traveled there or not, uh, every Jewish person is automatically an Israeli national and uh, because we all have birthright and right of return. So when people say, you know, I'm not against you, I'm just against Israel. Well, that's actually an anti-Semitic statement because what you're saying is you are against my one homeland. You can be against the political situation 
in Israel, you can be uh, very uh, angry or negative towards uh, ben Z- Benjamin Netanyahu, which I am. I am not a fan of Netanyahu's. Uh, just like you can disagree with any political uh, or government in any country around the world. But to be against the country itself, that means you're against the people. And that is what's anti-Semitic. A lot of the tropes that are being put up so easily on social media or displayed so easily on a poster board along the highway or overpasses, even here in Saskatoon, they ha- they are either blatantly anti-Semitic or they have anti-Semitic roots to them. Uh, people don't like to wear that title. It's, you know, you can... Calling someone a racist, they see it very black and white. But with anti-Semitism, they seem to believe that there is a degree to which they're allowed to be anti-Semitic. I can be lightly anti-Semitic. It's okay. Or, you know, I'm I, the Holocaust was awful. But, you know, the, the Jews deserve what they're getting right now. Has it forced you to change your behavior at all in, in Saskatoon? Like, are you are you walking through the world differently because of all of that? I don't know if I would say force. It certainly presented a few choices. Uh, I, I come from a liberal Jewish background, meaning that my level of, uh, of observance is not typically obvious to most people unless I do something or say something specific uh, or they know. Um, I'm, you know, Caucasian. I, I'm, I, I fit in with the general population. Um, but I used to wear my kippah every day. Uh, that little cap on on the top of my head. And when the attacks first started, because I just moved here, I was still a member of my previous synagogue out in Victoria, and we'd received an email from the congregation there saying, to the community for your safety, be considerate of your security while you're out in public. Take your safety as a priority over your display of any Judaica, of any obvious Jewish m- marks, such as men wearing a kippah, women covering their hair, or Judaica jewelry. Um, and that's that's another thing that sort of made me angry, of I'm not even safe to wear a kippah in Canada. So throughout this last year, I, I've worn my kippah out in public a lot less. I, I've practically stopped because it's just, my safety is most important, number one. Um, And then number two, it's not worth getting into arguments with people that aren't interested in actually learning the truth about a topic. Um, But what I've decided to do in the last few months is take more assertive ownership of my Jewishness. Take me back to October 7th. On the one hand, I wish I was there because I wish I could have helped or done something. On the other hand, I'm grateful that I'm not there, and I'm also grateful that none of my direct family are there. That's what I felt, that everyone that's very close to me is safe here in Canada or in the United States. Um, What I also felt was a huge sinking feeling of this is huge. This is not going to be over today, and this is going to be massive. And then quickly realizing that this was the largest single attack on Jews since the Holocaust. How do you think people will will process that day, the fact that it's one year on? I think with mixed emotions. I think a lot of our community will actually be angry because in our synagogue, uh, in the wall of our banquet hall, there's a poster for each one of the hostages that are still uh, in the tunnels under Gaza, uh, held by the Hamas terrorists. And you know we celebrate when someone is rescued and we take their poster down, but to still see so many posters up on the wall, I think will make a lot of us angry. And I think being that this will be the first anniversary, October 7th is a day that will go down in infamy for the Jewish community. This is going to unfortunately be a day that's going to exist permanently in our calendar, burned into our calendar as part of our regular Jewish life now. Um, You know, we have Holocaust Remembrance Day, uh, for example. This is going to be like that day for us. And 
I hope that very soon, you know, in years uh, looking forward, that we can commemorate this day as never again. I hope. But I'll admit that I'm angry that this day is approaching and it's not over. The terror is not over. We're still being vilified and yet some of our own people are still held hostage. Today on Blue Sky, we are hearing from five Saskatchewan people with deep ties to both Israel and to Palestine. Rebecca Gronofsky larsen is Jewish and lives in Regina. She's been very active in the pro-Palestinian and anti-Zionist movement. Her activism started long before this current war. But most recently, Rebecca is working to set up an independent Jewish Voices chapter in Saskatchewan. The organization says it represents Jews who are committed to social justice and to human rights. I don't know. I think overall a lot of people I know are, are struggling. Um, I'm, I'm involved with a lot of political activism work, and I know a lot of people that I've done organizing with for, like, decades are, like, everybody, I think, feels kind of um, despondent about the situation and um, is often looking for ways to plug in to try to see what they can do um, to try and, like, seek justice for people. But, like, it, it, I think I think a lot of people are struggling, and it's... Um, and for some communities, like, it, I think some people are, like, it's bringing up, like, either intergenerational trauma issues where they're having trouble reconciling what is happening right now with the history and what the history is that they've been taught. And so, um, like, I'm involved with a group called Independent Jewish Voices that's been trying to kind of extract um, Judaism from Zionism and to um, say, like, we, we can build a movement that is against colonialism here in Canada and abroad that is anti-racist and that is in solidarity with with Palestinians and the right to self-determination and security that we would want for any people like that. We literally would want as equally like we I have so many Palestinian friends and Jewish friends doing this work of trying to build um like to, to push back against some of the colonial violence that we're seeing right now. Mm -hmm. And so, um, yeah, no, I think it's a it's a very heavy time, to be honest. I think a lot of people have been in, you know, pretty dark places and um, are just doing what they can to try and shift the situation. Mm. What's it like for you to to share your perspective, to talk about this? I'm wondering what kind of reaction you get from people, whether that's people within the Jewish community, just people in Saskatchewan. I've also wondered how how sometimes how difficult these conversations can be within families. Even. Yeah, no, it's very mixed. And it's um, and I, I do try and be sensitive going into conversations and to take into account my audience, because I'm also like very aware of the different levels of, frankly, trauma that I think um, like, again, it, it is trauma that was was because of what happened in Christian countries that Palestinians had no part in. And so I find pa punishing Palestinians when Arab states were actually very, had laws protecting Jews often when Christian states didn't. And so it's like, it's a very misplaced form of punishment to like displace another people from our, their lands when we ourselves were displaced for so long. And so I find that part very hard, but then you're right, like definitely the conversations within families and within communities are hard. I think they need to be had, and I think sometimes it's hard for for people to hear from, you know, like Christians, uh, like frankly, like white Christians, <laughs> on that matter, because I think there is still a lot of like a sense of like, oh, anti-Semitism is like eternal, and that that's what's motivating your critiques of Israel. But in reality, like if you believe in universal concepts of justice and of human rights and of self-determination, you have to defend it in every country, and you have to defend it um, when any people is perpetuating genocide, including if you are Jewish and it is against Jews, you, you have to speak up. You have a moral obligation. I hear... Just I hear so much conviction in your voice, and I but I also hear a lot of uh, emotion. Like I, I can, I can feel that as 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 you're 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 talking, and we are coming up to October seventh, and I know that many people say this started long before that, but I am wondering what you're thinking about as that date approaches. 
it, it, it's hard because like I've, I've um, I don't know. I I was I was looking at this for like, and like really thinking through this for decades before that. Like I, I wrote my undergraduate thesis on liberation theology in Israel and Palestine and how we can get to like a Jewish theology of liberation that um, that that sees Palestinian liberation at this point as intertwined with Jewish liberation and as the movements as tied up. And that you cannot sustainably have one without the other. And if you have like kind of a an ongoing, like no political um, goal in sight of a like of a solution to it, and a very ongoing colonial occupation that there is frankly not been enough incentive to break. Like it, it actually does serve geostrategic interests in the area to have Israel kind of acting as a bulwark against a lot of the forces that like. Our governments don't really want to see active. And so, um, like, I, I don't know. You, I feel such incredible pain for uh, so many people that are really suffering through this. And I see a lot of despair amongst the people that I know, that I really respect, that have been working very hard on, like, peace and justice efforts and legitimately trying to struggle for... Um, for everybody to, to be able to live like a decent life in the territories. But I see more despondency now than I've ever seen before, as you see farther far right governments that are digging into the militarism and the racism. And it's actually just getting worse and worse. And it's getting harder for people to be able to live in Israel who dissent from this. Um, and so I think we do need to do more to build up global solidarity and movements that are like pushing for justice and to use our like actual real relationships with so, like a lot of people have family in Israel. And like I think we need to figure out how to push for global solidarity. One form that's obviously take as boycott, divest, and sanctions. But honestly, I don't think it's fast enough in the current context of how rapidly the genocide is unfolding and how many just – it just – I don't think we're willing to see like – like, frankly, babies and schools and hospitals and all these things bombed and just the most brutal, like, seeing people's homes bombed over and over, the entire, the obliteration of Gaza, the level of pain and suffering, and then seeing, like, my Palestinian friends and how hopeless or, like, how how impossible a moment this is to live through and feeling a very deep sense of both responsibility but empathy because I also know our own families and how that feeling of feeling like um, the state and the media really vilified people as they were facing a genocide. That, I think, is something that's been really hard to see my friends go through. And I feel like we have a real obligation to like, like humanize the situation and not let them vilify people and persecute people and go after their jobs here and go after the like very courageous students that are speaking up and sometimes against police violence. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I keep, I keep thinking as you're you're talking, um, you know, just to remind people like, you're 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 in Regina. I'm in Saskatoon. We're talking to people in Saskatchewan and you're talking about some really difficult things um, that are happening far away for a lot of people. Right. It feels far away. But yet. We're having this intimate conversation right now, and I am wondering what you want to leave Saskatchewan people with. And, and you know, I think about how you came into the studio, you've got kids to pick up, right? Like you're living your life day to day, and yet I hear all of this emotion in you. So I'm just wondering, you know, bringing it back to, to here and what you want Saskatchewan people to be left with. I just, um, I don't think anybody can speak on behalf of the entire community, but I think sometimes a problem has been that it's been perceived as like monolithic, like Jewish organization, like the Z Zionism and Judaism are somehow inter like interlinked in a way that is inextractable. But like the history of it was not that way. There were always many critics of forming a nation, like an ethno-nationalist state that was reliant on, frankly, like policies of colonization and Palestinians not having a state. And uh, there were a lot of opposition. There was a lot of opposition historically to that. And that current's continuing and it's actually growing today. Like a lot of the young people you see on campuses, there are so many, like if you look at the actual numbers, like there are so many Jewish students who see what is happening with their their friends from Palestine or who are in the diaspora that live like all over the, all over now because they were forced out of their countries. I'm seeing like a real um, 
like in some ways it's a very inspiring global movement um, of people coming together to like really force politicians um, like to act in a way that will defend human life. Well, Esper Bergman is someone you've met on Blue Sky before. He spoke to us on Father's Day, and he has a new book out called Special Topics on Being a Parent. It captures some of his experiences as a trans dad. But Bear is also Jewish and lives in Regina. I definitely am aware that every Jewish event now comes with a lot more security in Regina, and I think that first, in some cases, like at synagogue, you know, there's very often a police car sitting outside of the temple when I drop my kids off for Sunday school. And that's, you know, an exciting conversation to get to have with your third grader, right? Why are the police at temple again? Oh, well, that's, we hope, for your protection. Um, but also when there have been Jewish events like at the university, there is a lot of additional security because um, people are concerned that there will be protests. And so there's an increased security presence and again an increased police presence, which to me feels complicated because then it's not only a question of how much are we preventing legal protests and free speech. But also historically, that kind of security relies on the idea that some people are, you know, upon a brief visual inspection, right? Like, oh, you look like you are here for the lecture, whereas you look like you are here to disrupt it. And of course, that... Um, disproportionately burdens Jews of color, uh, queer and trans Jews, anyone that doesn't match what, you know, some security person or police officer thinks a Jew should look like, regardless of whether they know any actual Jews. That's been another uh, thing that has happened since I've lived in Regina that I had not really experienced before in my life. I regularly meet people for whom I am the first Jewish person that they are aware of ever having met. And so, you know, operating in this sort of higher security experience um, should feel, I guess, like I'm safer, but that's not actually what I experience. What I experience is a heightened amount of surveillance of every Jewish event. And I don't know that it actually is making us safer, to be honest with mm -hmm, you. Mm -hmm. How are you navigating really difficult conversations? The the war is is divisive. There the death toll is is it's unimaginable when we when we start looking at the numbers. And I'm wondering how, how you navigate some of those difficult conversations. Do people try to talk to you about it? Are they trying to get an explanation from you? Where do you find yourself landing on some of those really challenging conversations? I would say definitely explanation is the thing that people are asking me about the most. Um, less a question of, you know, do I think that Israel has the right to exist? Or do I think that... Um, the genocide of Palestinians should be stopped and more questions of what what is going on, you know, or people will say things that are wildly inaccurate, like, oh, well, Jews and Muslims have always been at odds for thousands of years, which simply isn't true at all. It's a complicated, long world history answer to get to and and what is happening here. And I have to try to provide that answer to people who kind of have nowhere to start. Like I would say nine out of ten of them couldn't name two Jewish holidays, even if you spotted them Hanukkah, which is the one uh, that, you know, the Christians of Saskatchewan seem generally to have heard of. Uh, so and every time... 
I get asked that series of questions, you know, I think in other places in Canada, it feels like a political purity test or an ideology test. What side are you on? Mm -hmm. Um, And here it just feels like, oh, I have discovered that I am in the presence of a Jew. Therefore, let me ask you every single question that I've ever had about Jews, Jewish culture or Jewish religion, regardless of, you know, how well we know each other or if you have time for this or Mm -hmm. the fact that there are Uh, Many other ways to find it out than, you know, subjecting me to a 45 minute interrogation outside my kids dance class. But again, I feel, you know, often like I've been sort of put in this position of ad hoc ambassador. And if I do a bad job, then I'm contributing perhaps to anti-Semitism, which I simultaneously understand isn't really true, but it feels true like people are going to hate Jews they're gonna hate Jews whether I do a good job or a bad job with the explanation but I always feel very aware that if I am not um, especially in Regina that if I'm not uh, conversational and helpful and cheerful about it then perhaps I'm the only Jewish person that they're aware of ever having spoken to. And I don't want to be, you know, I talked to one out of one Jews and he was rude. Therefore, Jews are rude and this is terrible. Mm -hmm. It's two things. One, I don't know where the conversation is going ever. You know, maybe we're just talking about what is Sukkot? Why, what, why are we eating outside? What holiday is this? What are we commemorating? But maybe we're on the way to a conversation about the history of Israel and Palestine, and I don't know that that's coming. Maybe we're doing, you know, remedial Jewish education because someone believes that being Jewish and supporting the state of Israel are the same thing. They're not. But I don't know any time, I never know what I'm walking into, and now it's doubled, or I guess perhaps exponentially it's uh, squared, right? Because it's not a one plus one situation. Each piece really amplifies and complicates the other. And now I'm doing, you know, a graduate seminar while I'm standing outside the wherever I happen to be, the dog daycare, right? Talking about, you know, we're starting at at whatever Jewish holiday or whatever Jewish concept, and we're ending up at Canadian foreign policy related to the ongoing genocide in Palestine. And I thought we were just talking about when do we light the candles, but now we're actually talking about wholesale murder. But like... Also, I have to get home and cook dinner, but also I don't want to be rude, and also I don't want to lose an opportunity for education, but also sometimes it's so emotionally complicated that to lead someone else through it in a thoughtful and useful way, you know, it sort of leaves me in like a little heap of feelings by the time I'm done and then you know whoever I'm speaking to Margaret is like oh thanks that was really helpful I super appreciate it and they toddle off feeling like they've learned and I have to just go home and lie down you know I've done 45 minutes on the ongoing trauma perpetrated by various governments on the Jewish people for the last 2500 years. I need a cookie. <laughs> right? And a and a and 20 minutes sitting quietly by myself. <laughs> We'd like to thank everyone who shared their perspectives with us for today's show. These interviews happened over the last several weeks and represent only a small fraction of the perspectives that are out there. We recognize that the crisis in the Middle East is continuously changing 
And there are many other people with ties to other Middle Eastern countries who are highly affected by this growing conflict. So if you would like to share your experience or your perspective, you can email us a voice note at bluesky at cbc.ca. You could also call Talkback 1-800-661-7540. Your feedback can help shape future shows.